So I'd like to talk now about markets as a peacekeeper, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, in some sense, it's just simply the, the obvious point that uh, if you've got a job and if you're busy working and you're earning income and you're feeling optimistic about your future, you're less likely to, re to resort to violence to get what you want. You're more likely to go to work, to please your boss, please your customers, hopefully please yourself, earn a decent income and live a good and decent life. If, on the other hand, those basic opportunities are denied to you, if you can't get a job, uh, if there is widespread unemployment, if there is considerable social disruption, for example, if you are effectively in a hopeless situation, you are more likely to be drawn to a life of crime, or at very least a, a life of vandalism just out of sheer boredom because there's nothing to do. Um, so... A basic takeaway is a booming economy tends to be uh, enhancing not only of financial prosperity and everything else you can buy with money, but inherently it tends to also solve a whole range of other social problems. Of course, we can sometimes end up in a problem in societies where there are people who are left out of the capitalist system. So there are a bunch of people who are enjoying the prosperity. They've got great careers, great prospects, but society might be too tiered or it might be bifurcated. And so some people are left behind. And we do see some very good uh, artistic representations of these dynamics. Uh, the recent Korean film Parasite, for example, very neatly captures how societies can have structural reasons why some people tend to flourish. They may be entrepreneurial, they may have elite career paths, they may go into top companies and whatnot. And other people get stuck uh, as, say, working poor, denied many of the opportunities that others have. So there are often structural reasons in societies why this happened, and there's a lot of debate about that. A lot of discussion about whether governments can solve it or maybe, in fact, governments potentially at times become the cause of those kind of inequalities, particularly if wealthy people uh, who made their money through the market system enlist the government to, to, in a sense, game the system, to make the system, as in, in a sense, work against them. Of course, those advocates of free markets... Um, in the economics profession and in particularly free market schools, say, out of the University of Chicago, generally see that often uh, the wrong kind of government involvements in markets often lead to those kind of inequalities that are often wrongly blamed on markets per se. That's an open debate, and that's one we'll come back to later on in the course. Um, I want to uh, advance it beyond this question of simply keeping the peace, though, and those questions of inequality and whatnot. Um, what the market system does, and, and as I say in my slides, the market system provides an allocation rule to ration scarce goods and opportunities. Clearly, it puts a price on things. Uh, we effectively have auctions. Everyone would love say in a city like Sydney, where the real estate by the harbour is just wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful city. If I, was, if I suddenly found myself a multi-millionaire, Sydney would be where I would like to live. I'm not so sure about that if I uh, didn't have money, because uh, it is a very big city. And the gulf between the beautiful the parts of the place and the less beautiful parts go quite extreme. So the decision rule is really straightforward. Uh, if you can find a whole lot of money, you can live a wonderful life with a view of the harbour. Okay? And arguably that actually gives uh, people a powerful incentive to try and get out there and start a business to be successful, precisely so they can buy that beautiful house by the, uh, the waterside. And an anecdote on this... Um, the most expensive real estate purchases in recent years were by several entrepreneurs in Sydney, new businesses, where people have, they, the people involved have become multimillionaires, and particularly uh, one very interesting chap, 
uh, a pioneer in IT, very successful business, provides a, provides a uh, platform upon which programmers can collaborate to, uh, to do programming in huge demand. And he's become incredibly wealthy and he uh, bought uh, a stunning house by Sydney Harbour off um, a once very wealthy uh, family who ran a major newspaper. So an interesting shift in the business dynamics. So this allocation rule, this, in a sense, putting a price on things is often criticised. But the positive side of it is that it gives everyone an incentive to try and uh, figure out how they can earn as much money as possible uh, by meeting the needs, the wants, the hopes of other people, which in turn is something that you can monetize and then buy the things that make you happy. So to quote Lindblom from his book, Politics and Markets, the market system, sorry, his other famous book is Politics and Markets, um, to quote, and I've got in the slides here, this decision rule limits every person's claims to a sum of money obtainable by that person's offer of something of value in the market. It's a quid pro quo rule, okay? So I can go to auction and bid for that house by the harbour um, up and to, up and to, up to the point where I can either repay a loan to pay for it or can pay for it cash. And my capacity to do so is very much a function of my ability to earn in the market system. It's quite obvious, really, when, when we think in those terms. Of course, some people immediately say, but hang on, you know, if you have a wealthy family, you don't have to do anything. You can just live off your parents' money. Absolutely. And this is one of the most controversial things about market systems, that some people get a huge head start because their grandparents or their parents were very entrepreneurial or very, very, just very fortunate, very well connected, were in the right place at the right time, for example. And this is where we do see very interesting discussions about the role of capital, the role of real estate, for example, in prosperity. Uh, in my advanced course, Enterprise and Governance, we talk about this. Uh, there's a big debate now around a French economist uh, called Piketty, read a very famous book called Capital, and he's got a new book out, Capital and Ideology. And a lot of his work shows that certainly it's true that if you're fortunate enough to inherit real estate in Shanghai or Paris or central London or Sydney, for example, that gives one a very significant head start. So there's certainly a place for government to have redistributive policies. And we see this, many countries have land taxes, for example, there are various ways to deal with some of these distributional consequences um, over time.